David Molnar here, your photography mentor. Welcome to episode four of the podcast. Four, yeah. Um, I'm here with my friend Rich Coleman and co-host. How are you doing today, Rich? Hello. I'm doing splendid. Swell. How are you, David? Awesome. Um, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Rich, I've got a question for you today. I'm ready. Okay. I've got a question for you today. What is Bruce Lee's favorite drink? Water! I got you water. I get it. That was good. I was thinking. I was thinking. (laughs) Do that again, though. I want to hear you with that. What? Okay. No, no, it's not. It's not one of those things I'm going to do too often. So you're welcome here. Um, well, hey, we are we are live. Um, episode four of the podcast. This has been fun. I've been I've been enjoying this. So far, so good. You know what we need to do right after this podcast episode is finish booking those flights to Norway. We've been looking at these flights, and I don't know what what our holdup is. Am I the hold? I'm probably the holdup, right? Uh, well, there's a lot of variables, like no joke for anybody listening. It is uh, more expensive for David to get from his undisclosed location of Florida to New York than it is for us to get to New York, two flights to Norway, like the most expensive tickets, your ticket to New York and back. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, isn't that nuts? Did you see that like awesome PDF or a Photoshop document I made you with screenshots yesterday? You did. It was so cute. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, I was just trying to help our brains wrap around. But yeah, Norway, it's happening. Uh, yeah. Hello, thank you, coronavirus, for uh, making the airfare cheaper. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Find, I'm like, I'd like to find – the glass is half full with me, David. So yeah. I promise when I come back I won't visit any old folks' homes or anything like that. I'm just going to stick to myself and make sure I'm not contagious, I promise. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. Well, hey, we're going to give away something today, right? I have it right here. Okay, sweet. What are we giving away today? What do we want to give away? Well, here, how about this? We have like a very manly looking bag. Mm. And then but if, so but if a lady, yeah, rugged, if a lady is a winner, we could give her the option to win this lady like looking bag. Mm. So, I So you saying blue is too lady like? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying David Monar Blue is a little effeminate for me, but whatever. It's, well, it matches whatever. your eyes. <laughs> whatever. Um, but yeah, back, bags for days from our great friends at B&H Photo. Yep, yep. Well, okay, so we're, we're going to do that away. And in order to register for that giveaway, all you got to do is click the share button. We're just making it really easy. Just click the share button on this live yeah. video right now. Um, share this with your Facebook friends. We want to help out as many people as possible. And I'm excited because today is going to be a really good episode. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, it's going to be it's going to be a really good episode. Um, and so just click that share button and then you'll be registered to win that bag, uh, that giveaway. And uh, we'll just we will, we will randomly pick someone. Let us know in the comments also that you have registered registered as and shared it. And uh, let us know where you guys are tuning in from. We've got a ton of y'all tuning in right now. We got um, Florida. We got Colorado. We got Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We got people from all over saying hey. Yep. Yep, we got people from tuning in from all over. So welcome to all you live podcast listeners. Um, this it's awesome to go live because hey, we might be able to answer your questions. Um, and you also potentially could win, you know, something. So if you're tuning in on iTunes, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, feel free to leave us a review. That'd be awesome. We want to help out as on many iTunes, people as yeah. possible on iTunes. Yeah. <laughs> if your review is in the Facebook comment and you're just like, this is good, that, that doesn't, you know, whatever. Anyways, I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate we it. Appreciate <laughs> it <but laughs> we appreciate I, it. We appreciate it. We kind of left people on a cliffhanger last week. I don't know if you remember. Hmm. See, I brought it back this up. Tr- this is true. I literally, I'm so glad you brought it back up. Um, all right, so. Uh, okay, I'm gonna preface. I'm I'm gonna preface this story. I got called my nickname yesterday <laughs> in the locker room at the YMCA, <laughs> just to make it that much better. Uh, and this is like that's a true story, th- and it's th- just so common that I just like accept it. <laughs> so this, the fact so this- that it's true doesn't make it worse, you know. Okay, so just full disclaimer, this is going to sound – it's not, but it's going to sound a little bit explicit. So it's we're going to have that little E – we're going to have that little E on this episode on iTunes. Um, so are you guys ready? If you're ready in the comments, say, I'm ready for the nickname because yeah. here, here comes the short story of my nickname. <laughs> the little story. The little story. It's a little teeny story. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. All right, you ready? Here we go. So David, 
Growing up, I'm a junior. I am Richard Jr. Richard yes. Coleman Jr. Yes. So my dad goes by Dick. My dad is a dick. <laughs> so my whole life, my dad's been a dick. So, so you as go to the hardware I, store, right? And yeah, hey, Dick. Like, uh, yeah, that's just like normal. It's like Dick Van Dyke. Nobody, nobody thinks it's weird there. Yeah. But as an eight-year-old boy sitting on like the counter where my dad worked, all of his friends kind of gave me a nickname – that at the time I thought it was really cool I had a nickname. <laughs> and that nickname is Little Dick. Yeah. So my dad is Dick, or now I guess he's Big Dick. And here I am, Little Dick. Eight years old, it's fine. But David, can I tell you a little story? Yes, you may. Yes, you may. The older I got, the worse that story gets. <laughs> I was once in Walmart. I played music. And I was in Walmart with this much older not much older, two years older, attractive lady that I was trying to like, be friends with. And we're in Walmart hanging out together, writing songs together. So we just go to Walmart to hang out and buy something. And lo and behold, you write, you write in, songs in Walmart. Is that what you're telling that's me? That's right. Yeah. We're, it's just for inspiration on the it's outer bank. <laughs> you, you have to, it's, it's like, it's like the public, like common ground. So me and Molly are in, are in Walmart and all the way at the end of the longest aisle, I just hear this toothless HVAC guy say, little dick, is that you? And I cringe and I cower and I'm like, God, no, not right now. So I like quickly like go to another aisle and he just chases me down and proceeds to say little dick 30 times in the conversation. And that was the most embarrassed I've ever been over my name. But now I embrace it. Now it's kind of normal. And when somebody calls me little dick at the YMCA, it's when you're in the locker room. Yeah, it's that's a weird place to have it, but I was happy it happened for the podcast. So yeah, yeah, I d um, I happened to be getting dressed in the locker room and my nickname came up. So it happens. <laughs> I can't go a week without hearing it. So I've just embraced it. Um, my friends made me a PlayStation profile because I'm not much of a gamer, but they made one and my name is Little Dick. So if you're playing PlayStation and a little dick pops up in your screen, it's me. That's the, the story. The name. The, the name. The name. <laughs> the name oh man. Uh, oh gosh. Oh. Uh, so yeah. you're so you're at Walmart because it's like the mall. It's like the cool place to gather on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Yeah, at, man, circa 1992. What, yeah, and I was like the younger kid that would like happen to be in like playing music with like the prettiest girl in school, and it was just awful. And she just looked at me like afterwards, like, what the heck? And I'm like, it's a nickname. Uh, like, you know, like there's no, there's no coming back from that. You're just like, yeah. But little by little, you got used to it. Little by little. I'm just, I own it. You know, like when you get old enough, like I'm married, have two kids. I don't care. You know, right. the little dicks here to stay. I'm ready for it. Right. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, Oh man, that's awesome. When you were telling me the first that I forget where we were when you were telling me that story for the first time, where we wasn't Florida. I don't remember. I, I, I yeah, forget. it's weird. It's weird. It's weird when people know me that don't know it, and then somebody just calls me that, and then I just go with it. Like I'll be at like Surf and Spoon, and they all scream it when I walk in this ice cream place, and like Everyone's I just like, like have a comp I, everybody does that, but like me and whoever I'm talking to just go into normal banter. Right. I don't. It's not weird to me because I'm so used to it. Right. <laughs> Oh, love it. Love it. Well, thank you for sharing. Well, that was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful intro to podcast. <laughs> for, if I do say so myself. <laughs> oh, man. So I'll, I'll try not to use that too often on the podcast just because maybe our new listeners wouldn't know. And if I'm like, hey, little dick, you know, like, how are you doing yeah. today? Uh, I feel like it would probably. I, know, it might be, it might be a good like Easter egg to throw in there every now and then. <laughs> yeah, a good one. Um, and if you don't know what we're talking about, go back to the intro of episode four. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> I promise I'm not trying to be crude, you know, I'm just, you know. Call him by his name. It's um, my name. Awesome. Well, hey, today we want to um, we want to talk about you know I'm calling it um, kind of like the five steps to becoming a professional photographer. I should even say an expert photographer. Okay, three of the things. Sometimes I identify them as the three superpowers um, of a photographer. Okay, or of you know professional professional photographers. I'm working on the terminology. Okay, working on it. Um, but money? <laughs> it's it's not so much it's not so much that it's like we're going right to the, the point of trying to make money, but today I want to talk about the five essential steps that you need to go through if you want to um, make money as a professional photographer or 
as a, um, you know, e even as a, as a part-time photographer. And arguably these steps are the exact same steps that you go to, you go through um, to just take amazing photos, to take the photos that you see in your head, okay? Um, to, to really take the photos that you've always dreamed of. You can just stop at the last part, which is build your business. So I'll kind of give you that. There's four different steps and the final step is build, which is talking about building your business. So even if you just wanna take amazing photos just for you, these first four steps are perfectly applicable to every single person um, who is listening to this podcast episode. So Rich, do you know what these steps are? Do you know what step number one is? We're going to, we're going to go through these five steps or these five parts of the path. To become step the number one is C. And mm -hmm. what does that mean, David? How does seeing help you master your, your photo superpowers? Your photo superpowers. It's, you know, arguably learning to see like a professional photographer, um, is the first of the superpowers. Okay. And, um, and what I mean by learning to see like a photographer is, um, is being able to see before you ever pick up the camera, okay, before you ever change any dials, before you set up any studio lights, before you do anything, before you even direct your subject, it's learning to look at or imagine or conceive a situation and see the story that you want to tell ahead of time to be able to foresee, if you will, okay, to be able to figure out what is important in the story that I want to tell and how can I use um, the skills that I've learned um, if I'm in the photo mentorship and I'm learning you know, all about how to master my camera or master editing, or if I'm learning studio lighting, whatever it is that you're learning at this point, because you know we have courses on all of those things in the photo mentorship, photomentorship.com. Regardless of which you know, level of skill that you're learning in photography, as you're learning to see, you can start you know, uh, conceptualizing what you want that story to look like. So learning to see comprises of a lot of things. It's figuring out, okay, what is the story that I want to see? Or what is the potential stories available to me in this setting? So I'm already like conceptualizing the shots that I want to, uh, to take in Norway when we're there. I'm like, yeah, man, I want to be up on the top of the fjords. I don't want to be looking down and I want to see like just this amazing thing and I want it to be sunset because that's the sea, that's what I'm seeing in my head. That's the story that I'm imagining that I want to craft when I'm there. And then I want to do some self portraits or have Rich shoot a portrait of me where I'm like up there on the top of like a mountain and then way over here, Rich is up higher or maybe he's shooting it with a drone shot and he's looking down and I'm standing on the tip of a mountain uh, and, and then you can see the majestic fjords uh, and the other mountains rising out of the, you know, of the fjords in the background and it's sunset and it's majestic. Like that's what I'm seeing ahead of time. And I know that there's certain things that I need to be able to set on my camera or that Rich needs to set on his camera to be able to accomplish the vibe and the feel and the story that I want to tell. Okay. So learning to see like a photographer is, is basically recognizing um, what, what makes an image good and what makes an image, it's recognizing what are the important elements to tell in the story that you're trying to tell. It's recognizing, okay, this story that I'm envisioning about this majestic Norway, Nor, 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 Norwegian, 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 Norwegian. There we go. Uh, I, I was in the, I was in the right region. I just wasn't, you know, getting the word right. Um, hey, uh, when I'm imagining this, I'm thinking, okay, I want to have the elements um, of you know the mountains. I want to have the fjords. I want to have the sunset, and I want to have it vibrant colors. So I don't want it to be a super crazy cloudy blah gray day. I want it to be a clear, be beautiful day, maybe with some white puffy clouds. I want it to be close to sunset or sunrise. I want it to be up. I want the photographer to be up at a little bit of a higher angle so that he can look down. Um, you know, on what's going on. So maybe it's a drone shot. Maybe it's a, a little bit higher. I'm not sure what the situation is going to be, right? And um, yeah. I'm also thinking it needs to be a wide angle shot. I don't want it to be zoomed in because I want to show the majesty of the scene, okay? So when you start to develop this superpower of learning to see like a professional photographer, you can start, you know, combining the elements of skill that you're learning, combining, you know, the experience that you have of like what types of lenses to use, and, um, and what type of lighting to use and all these things. And you're also combining, okay, if I shoot it in this way, then I think I can set myself up to, to win when I'm editing it later. So learning to see like a photographer is being able to foresee, okay, what is the story I wanna tell? 
And if that's the story I want to tell, how do I shoot it? What types of lenses do I need to accomplish you know, the feelings that I want to create? And then if I'm going to shoot it in this way with this type of lens, how do I need to shoot it so that I can edit it to where it actually turns out like the end result that I want? Okay, so what I don't do, what professional photographers don't do is just show up and start shooting. No, they've potentially scouted the scene. They know that they want this background and they want this lighting scenario and they want to use this lens to achieve the result that they want to achieve. And they're going to potentially overexpose or underexpose because of the way that they want to edit it in the end. Okay, mm. there's also a whole other part of seeing, and I, I think probably what we should do, Rich is each of these five parts, I think we should have a unique podcast episode about each of these things. I'm all about it. Okay, because there's all sorts of rules of composition as in regards to seeing. There's all sorts of ways that you can use compression or, you know, or stretching, whether it's wide angles, to tell vastly yeah. different stories. There's all sorts of things that you need to understand when you're learning how to identify what are the essential storytelling elements and how do I put them in the forefront while excluding the parts of the story that are not important. Learning how to see is in depth, and it's one of those things that actually comes natural to some people, okay? So it, that's awesome. Some people say, I have a good eye, right? And so maybe there's some, thing, there's some things that you can naturally compose images and see things in your head, and some of you guys have that gift. But let me tell you, if you don't feel like you have that gift, that's okay. You're probably like it's teachable, me, and you can learn how to see like a photographer, <laughs> Mm. Okay. That's exactly why we have, you know, our amazing membership community called the photo mentorship, because you can, we can teach you how to see like a photographer, even if you feel like you don't have that natural eye. Okay. Yeah. Now the second, and I would part, say, go ahead. I would say arguably that it, seeing the, it's great that you start with that. I think it might be the most important. Like, I don't know what your notes say about that, but that's why you give somebody like you an iPhone. Mm hmm. Or somebody that's just starting out a six thousand dollar rig, your pictures are going to be better, even though the sensor's smaller, because you know that just standing up at five and a half feet and taking a picture is going to, you know, the most boring camera angle in the world is is how it's eye five level. and a half feet right. eye level. Yeah, every every everybody sees at eye level, so it's not very. There's no wow factor to eye level. Um, so that's a, a thing that. You know, seeing like a photographer, it, it kind of takes take all the bare bones of everything David just said. It doesn't matter the gear, the lens. Just exactly. seeing like a photographer makes your pictures better. Yeah, if you just simply learn how to see like a photographer, regardless of whether or not you have a four hundred dollar camera kit or you have a, you know, a uh, I just pulled my five D Mark IV over. If you have you know a four or five thousand dollar camera setup, or if you have an iPhone. It doesn't really matter because now you're starting to learn how to see like a photographer and tell the story that you want to tell, okay? And there's there's so many facets to seeing and there's so many ways that you can, there's so many different ways to see and there's not necessarily wrong ways to see. It's about using your creativity and your imagination to be able to tell the story that you want to tell. Now, you could tell that story of that Norwegian scene um, as a dark, somber scene. You could tell it as a bright, vibrant, sunny day. You could tell it as you know the, the, the magnificent, majestic colors of sunset. And those are three, they could be the exact same story in the exact same location from the exact same camera angle with the exact same wide angle lens. But the story there is going to tell vastly different things. And imagine if you now, it's nighttime, and you have the majestic norm, uh, northern lights, you know, lighting the sky on this green fire above it. These are all going to tell vastly different stories, okay? And uh, so, and and then there's the whole thing of like how you edit it. What are the vibes that you give to it? There's so many different ways to be able to, you know, to be able to see this. And I can tell you some stories about when I started off as a photographer. But what I'm going to do, it sounds like you guys love this idea of having individual episodes on each of these five steps that we're about to talk about. So I think. You know, if you guys like that idea, we might do that over the, over the course of the next few weeks and kind of create a little series of how to become an amazing photographer, regardless of whether or not you want to turn pro or just take amazing images for yourself and your friends and just, you know, for, for your viewing pleasure. Okay. Um, are you ready to go to step number two? Step number ready? two. I'm ready. ready. All right. So step number two is learning to shoot your camera in manual mode like a professional, 
Okay. And it goes beyond that because, you know, arguably it's, it's beyond just shooting your camera in manual mode, but it's also learning just this technical skill side of photography. Okay. So many people rely on the automatic mode, that devil mode there in green, you know, green means devil. It doesn't mean go. It means, means devil, right? Auto, Auto is the devil. Is the devil. Auto, Auto is, the, is devil. the devil. Auto is the devil. And, you know, and so here's the thing, you can imagine this amazing story <laughs> And, uh, you know, like the stuff that I'm talking about, you can imagine this amazing story, but if you don't know how to control your camera, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories that you'll never be able to tell. You'll never be able to, even the things that you see in your head, you won't be able to tell those stories if you do not learn how to master your camera. Okay. If you don't know how to master your camera and control it completely in manual mode, you will always be guessing what your images are turn out like you mm. will just be guessing you know like uh, it'll be a guessing game right it'll be guessing your your okay. cam your camera's smart but your camera doesn't know what you want and when you take full manual control over your camera you're telling that camera what to do so instead of the camera telling you what you can do you're saying look camera i'm going to make you do what i want exactly. so as smart as your auto mode is and they're getting smart it's still not going to do what you're brain, your 11 stops of light, your eye sees can do. Can it see 11 stops? Are you making 11 that up? Stops, or? That's no, that's L real. Like, like technical, like I always wondered, like I, I didn't actually know that. Learned yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what? why I can, that's why I can look out. I can look at my window and I can see shadows, highlights. I can read this post-it in front of me and I can also read the car by the side of the road I'm really because your eyes amazing. Isn't it cool? Like that's like such a, like God designed our eye in such a way like that's it's the most amazing thing on your body, your eye, like what it can do. Like that's why you look Except at the moon, and you're like, man, that's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. Hey, sorry. Oh, no, it's um, okay. Make fun of it. It's okay. I'm married and my wife is hot. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's why when you look at the moon and you're like, oh, that's so beautiful, and you get like really frustrated trying to take a moon picture, it's mm -hmm. because you have this little box that's not nearly as advanced as your eye, you know. Right. It's amazing what your eye can do. So that's what mastering your camera is, learning how to use, shoot your camera on manual mode. You're just trying to get that as close to what your eye can see. And, you know, like our next point also, um, that's the most important part. Yeah, and, and I just want to add, because the next point is really important, because when you're um, – when you're shooting, it's not just that you want to shoot in manual mode, okay? It's not that you just want to achieve the result of switching your you know, camera over to M for manual mode. It's not just that. It's learning how to master your camera in manual mode and actually achieve the results that you're seeing in your head, okay? It's not just getting by and getting an okay exposure. It's actually crafting the story that you were envisioning. It's using your camera, manually controlling your camera to create that vision, okay? Because just like Rich is saying, it's such an amazing point. As amazing as your camera is, it cannot read your mind. What it can do is get an okay, decent exposure. It can get an image most of the time. Now, there are scenarios where it's going to do a horrible job every time. But for, for the most part, it can get a picture that looks correctly exposed. that's not too bright and not too dark, pretty much. That's what automatic mode does, right? Yeah, uh, now, sometimes. If, you're in, if you're in a silhouetted situation or a tricky lighting situation, forget it. Camera doesn't really do a good job of that. But, you know, so what the camera can do in automatic mode is sort of, some of the time, get a good looking image that's not too bright or not too dark, some of the time. But what it cannot do, okay, is it doesn't know whether or not you want the, the waterfalls to be flowing through your image or for those water droplets to be frozen. It does not know if you want the focus to be exclusively on the eyes and have everything else be blurred in the background. It does not know where you should be zoomed in on um, or what you're envisioning, what kind of compression you want, how, you know, how perfectly um, normal you want the face looking or whether you want it distorted. It doesn't know those things. That's why you take manual control. Those are just a couple of quick examples of whether or not you want the, black, the background to be perfectly blurred um, or perfectly crisp and in focus in the background. It doesn't know those things. And those are just some simple examples. So when you see the story in your head of, I want the Norwegian fjords in the background and I want everything to be in focus and I want to make sure the, the image is um, exposed slightly dark so that I have more, um, more information in my image to be able to edit later, your camera doesn't know that stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. All it's gonna do is take this autofocus 
uh, this automatic photo, autofocus and automatic mode are two different things, by the way. Um, all it's gonna yeah. do is just try to get an image that looks okay, it's like average. Literally, that's what your camera does, is it averages oh, yeah. all the light, and it's gonna create an average photo. Okay, it's and it, and I would say I would say it's really easy to be like discouraged when somebody starts shooting, you know, well. Too the thing is, and this is true in a lot of areas in your life. There's trained and there's untrained. Me and David aren't any smarter than you. We are just trained at what we're doing. It's like going out and practicing anything. You're going to become proficient in it and. David's not the – I mean he's a smart, cute-looking dude, but he's not the smartest guy in the world. He's just Thanks trained. He knows, exa yeah, he knows exactly how to use those camera settings to do what he wants because he's trained. Um, and that's what I love from our students in the photo mentorship is we're just giving them training, which gives them confidence, which makes their pictures better. And it's just – it's it seems so hard and unobtainable, but it's really, really – easy with training. And that's what I love about working here and helping anybody. I love helping anybody get past a frustration point and taking a better picture. That's just huge for me. I love it. Love that. Love that. Yeah, that, that, that's so good. Well, and so this brings us to the third point. So the, here's the thing, as amazing as our cameras are, they don't know what you're thinking in automatic mode. They can't read your mind, okay? They don't know the story that you're seeing in your head or that you're envisioning. It's really important to understand, okay? The other thing they can't do is exactly the point that Rich mentioned a few minutes ago where he said, our eyes can see 11 stops of, of light. Now, I actually would really love to know that science. If you have any articles or any references on that, I've actually been wondering. I got you. I'm like, I, yeah, let me know. I'd love we'll to put them in the show thing. notes. We'll put them in the show notes. And we can talk about it too if you want um, or if you have any more information yeah. on it. But because um, I'd love to, that's that's a fascinating subject because God's like the best designer in the world. And, you know, Nikon and Canon are good, but they, they ain't God, you know. Um, so but here's the thing, you know, our eyes can see so much more. What Rich just said, and I don't know the science or the validity to this, so hopefully he's telling the truth. He says that we can see 11 oh, stops God, of it's, light. It's actually, it's actually more. It's about 10 to 11, but like there's like studies saying that it's actually closer to 30 because of the increments in between stops and mm -hmm. we're not in very many situations where we where there are 30 stops of light mm -hmm. so that's true. 10 to 11 is correct and that's from a good google search i just did <laughs> and google always tells the truth especially when it's about politics and things like that but anyways all right we'll make uh, we'll make we'll make a blog post we'll do a blog post this week about how many stops of light the human eye can see compared to your camera boom i love that i'm like fascinated about that sorry yeah, so, I mean, so here's the, here's the truth. I, I know, I know, <clears throat> I know a ton of you guys have experienced this, right? Where, um, where your camera doesn't see the same amount of details as you and I see with our God-given eyes, because you and I, let's say it's sunset, okay, and you and I can see the the amazing vibrant colors in the sunset, in you know the, all the highlights that are in the sunset, and the, the kind of the shadows that are on the opposite sides of the clouds. We can see all that information, and then beneath the horizon, we can still see the greens and the trees, and we can see the yellows and the flowers at sunset. At the same time, we can see the light on our subject's face that's standing right in front of us, but your camera can't. Okay, so because. Rich is saying that our eyes can see 11 or more stops of light. That means that we can see the bright brights and we can see the dark darks. So the highlights and the shadows all at the same time. And we can reconcile them and actually piece together an image that looks evenly balanced between the highlights and the shadows beneath the horizon. Our cameras can't actually do that natively. Okay. They can't see, you pretty much have to choose. Do I want to look at the highlights correctly exposed so that the sunset for an example, or do I want the flowers and the trees to look properly exposed? Meaning I see the yellows or the reds and the flowers and I see the greens and the trees, but then the sky looks completely blown out and white. The highlights are too bright. They're too overexposed. You pretty much have to choose between what you want to look correct in camera. Okay. But my friends, this is why we edit. We edit to recreate that emotion that we feel when we're seeing that scene with our own God-given eyes that can see 11 or more stops of light, that can reconcile the entire situation of highlights and shadows and piece together this beautiful scene that we see with our eyes. Our cameras can't do that because God is a better designer than, than Canon is, than Nikon is, okay? Maybe they'll get better. But, that's, but that's why God gave us Lightroom. 
<laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's the guy said, let there I stole, be I stole, light. I stole, I stole that from Linda. So that's not me. Like it was just funny. And I, re, I, re, I reset it. So thank you, Linda, for the great, awesome truth joke. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Okay. I didn't even see that comment. And then God said, let there be light room. Okay. But no, th this is exactly why we edit. We edit to recreate the emotion that we were feeling when we were viewing that gorgeous aesthetic scene with our own eyes. Okay. When we could see all the details in the sky and beneath the horizon. So we edit to recreate emotion or rather to create that motion to finish off our images so that our viewers can feel that intense pleasure that we felt when we were viewing this scene with our own eyes. So they can feel that emotion, so they can be awestruck, so they can experience that beauty of that sunset where you can see the majestic colors and the highlights of the sky and the stunning vibrant colors of the spring flowers and greens that are starting to pop up all over the place. I'm glad it's spring because that's my favorite, except for allergies, mm. right? We <laughs> edit to create emotion so that our viewers can feel the same things that we felt, okay? Oh, Not yeah. to make an image fake, not to make it surreal, unless it's your thing, but we actually just edit to finish the process. We're gonna yeah, we want to we want to enhance the edit to what our eyes see. So people will off, often accuse of over editing, and then you're like, no, really, my eye saw saw it like this. Like this is what it was like to be there. I, trust me, I was there. So you, you want to enhance a photo, not alter like that. I'm a huge fan of like not overdoing it, but Lightroom and editing correctly can be huge to help you capture the feeling of what it was like to be there as David was saying, because that's the most important part. Taking a picture is great, but capturing a moment and capturing a feeling turns your picture into art and that lasts forever. Yeah, that that's awesome. That, that, that's, that's yeah, absolutely. Well, so the, you know, step one, I call these the three superpowers. These are the three parts to becoming, you know, to shooting world-class images and, and turning pro. Uh, they're three of the five parts, okay? So we have, you know, step one is learning to see like a photographer. It's learning to be able to craft that story in your head and identify what is possible, what's feasible. And you're starting to identify how to achieve the story that you want to see like a professional photographer. That is superpower number one. Superpower number two is to be able to technically master your camera, okay? To be able to shoot in complete manual mode and actually get the pictures that you are intending. Now, understanding that you have limitations with the camera is really important, okay? That, you know, you can't actually document all the information that you can't actually just achieve the result in the camera that you and I see with our eyes, okay? This is where so many people get frustrated. Uh. You know, so this is where I still, I still get fresh. I still get frustrated with it. Yeah, oh, it's one of, of those things you're like, oh, why can't I get there? But it's because yeah, it, your it, eyes it, are awesome. Yeah, your eyes are awesome. They're, they're more awesome. And uh, so knowing that you have those limitations are good because then when you understand the limitations that you have, you can manually shoot your camera in a way that's going to help you uh, overcome those limitations that you have while shooting so that you can do the third superpower, which is to edit your photos to recreate that emotion. Okay, so see, shoot, edit. Okay, um, those are the three superpowers. All right, so moving on to step number four. We're going, I guess, we're going to steps or the fourth part of this, you know, framework to becoming a world class. This is, this is after you're a superpower. So after you're already a superhero, we've the, already gone through season one before you put on your costume. Now right. is when, now is when you get kind of decked out and you're, you're going to be. A specific superhero, and this You're is where you get a little your little decked out, little decked, yeah, out, little decked out. Okay, um, yes, yes. This, this is, is season two. Of, this is this is this is season two of Daredevil this when is, he has concentration. Is, oh, Daredevil! That that was such a, a pretty violent show, but it, but masterfully crafted. Um, not the Ben Affleck one, but like the the Netflix one. Anyways, yeah. I was so sad when they discontinued it. But anyways, um, yeah, those three steps: see, shoot, edit. Okay, those three superpowers. Those are kind of like the foundational like superpowers. That's when like, you know, like Rich is saying when Superman is growing up or whoever, like they're developing, they're becoming who they're, who they're trying to become. It doesn't mean they're necessarily have mastered their craft. It means that they're getting proficient in, in seeing ahead of time the story that they want to tell, executing technically and shooting the story that they're trying to tell. And all while understanding, you, if you shoot an image in certain ways, you can kind of screw yourself in the editing process. Okay. Mm. For, so for an example, if you're shooting the sunset 
and you accidentally shoot it manually in such a way that the sky is too bright, well, let me tell you, the details in the sky is gone. The, those information in the highlights, they are gone, okay? Um, so if you shoot you know, a sunset and the sky is too bright, then you're kind of, you're kind of screwing yourself over a little teeny bit um, by losing that information um, you know, in, in the camera, okay? It's gonna be really hard to edit that when you get back to the editing process coming back. So it's good to understand what your limitations are in each of these parts of the, of the three superpowers in the first three steps, okay? And then you can only edit, technically you can edit to the gazillionth degree, right? But you can't edit to make a bright sky look correct. A sky that's too bright, the information is gone, okay? So you can't pull that information back in when you're editing. So those three things, they, they are such like a, um, a synergistic, there are three synergistic superpowers. You need to be able to meld those things together and constantly be, you're constantly thinking about the other three, okay? When I'm seeing, okay, I'm thinking about how I can shoot it in such a way that I can edit it and finish it. It's all the same thing. The seeing is essentially making the plan, okay? And when I'm shooting it, I'm thinking about, okay, if I shoot it this way, hopefully I won't shoot myself in the foot for later when I'm trying to edit it, okay? So it's, it's all interconnected, okay? And then when you're editing stuff, you might realize, wow, I really wish I had shot it this way. So next time, it's kind of a retro, everything is clear in 20, you know, hindsight, it's always 20, hindsight's always 20, 20, right? So I've done so many times where I've, you know, shot something and got to the editing process and I realized, man, if I had only realized how difficult it would be to edit it if I shot it that way, like for instance, overexposing the sky when I'm shooting a sunset, then I can learn a lesson to be able to better plan what I'm seeing next time so that I can better execute what I'm shooting the next time photos. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and craft the story that I want to craft so that I can finish it well, you know, with editing. Okay. So those are the foundational things that you need to develop regardless of whether you ever want to be pro or not, regardless of whether you want to just take images that are for your Facebook friends or for our amazing, um, community student group for the photo mentorship, you know, regardless of what you want to take. Uh, these photos for, you need to learn how to see like a professional photographer, shoot like a professional photographer. So manually control your camera in manual mode, master your camera, and then three, edit to recreate that emotion. All right. I know, I've, I know we've hashed that a bunch. Then we move on after the foundational steps, we move on to step number four. Okay. And this is a step that goes towards pursuing your dreams. Okay. This next step is, is a pivotal foundational step for turning pro, but it's also a pivotal foundational step to just achieve the images that you see in your head, okay? To be able to achieve the type of images that probably you got started with photography to begin with. So for instance, okay, um, if you started in photography because you wanted to shoot better photos of your pets, okay? Um, or if you started uh, photography to shoot uh, because you wanted to shoot better photos of your kids or because you were like me and you wanted to shoot beautiful photos of nature, okay? Landscapes or wildlife or whatever it is. Once you learn those three superpowers, those three foundational parts of photography, which are not easy to learn. We make it super easy inside the photo mentorship, by the way. If you do want to learn any of those things, we can help you and teach you step-by-step step over our shoulder. Just go to thephotomentorship.com and you can stream all of our courses Okay, you get unlimited access to all of our courses and you get all of your questions answered um, from me and Rich and, the, and our other professional um, photography mentors that we have on staff. Okay, so it's really an amazing resource if you want to learn the step-by-step -step process to learning how to see like a photographer, shoot like a professional photographer, and edit like a professional photographer. But then beyond that, once you get past that foundation, you need to start specializing. Okay, because before we were talking about generic I don't say generic, but foundational levels of photography. See, shoot, and edit, those are pretty foundational, okay? You have to have but them. You have to have them, okay? To be to take great photos, world-class photos, you have to, to have them. You have to have them, absolutely. But then it goes beyond of like being a general photographer, general photographer. It goes to the next step of actually specializing, okay? Rich, what's some examples of ways that you could specialize in photography? 
Well, I like your analogy. So imagine C shoot and edit is Bruce Wayne learning karate and he doesn't become Batman until he specializes, gets branded, boom. He's a superhero that now has a specialty and he stops getting beat up as much. So that's just a to play on your analogy. But there's a lot of specialties. I special I specialized in wedding photography for years. Um, you know, professionally for twelve years exclusively only shooting weddings and paying my mortgage and letting my wife be a stay at home mom. So it's totally doable to use this creative fun thing that you love to make a full time, awesome income on. And that's just one specialty. The great thing about photography is pretty much anything you love and anything you love sharing, you can find a way to get paid to capture it. If you hunker down in a speciality and become great, like you become a specialist. So being a doctor is great, but sometimes you need a heart surgeon. Sometimes you need a neurosurgeon. So people don't spend money at a general practitioner. You know, they want to see a neuro, you know, a, a neurosurgeon. They want to see a thoracic heart surgeon. So what you have to do is find your specialty, thrive in your specialty. And just kind of hunker down and get into it. It's it's not always the funnest, and it takes some practicing. But you, you eventually, when you find your specialty, and honestly, I think a lot of times your specialty finds you because it's what gives you life. It, what's it's what makes you excited about doing what you're doing. But once you find your special speciality, and then you start working at it, making money at it, you you've arrived. You're no longer working. You're 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 enjoying life and getting paid for it, and that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so once you once you go beyond learning those foundational superpowers, right? Um, like you said, Bruce Wayne learning you know learning karate or going to <clears throat> Raz Al Ghul or whatever. Sorry for the for the geeky yeah. references here. We're nerds. Um, I'm a nerd. I can't help yeah, it. Yeah, I'm totally a nerd. <clears throat> um, beyond learning those foundational superpowers, you need to go to the next thing, the thing that you actually want to pursue. And I love how Rich just said, sometimes your specialty finds you. Okay. But if you want to shoot, like for me, I love landscape photography. That's why I'm so excited to book these flights for Norway, hopefully in a few minutes here. Today. Um, yeah. yeah we, get, we Every day we're like, today we're going to book the flights. And then something comes up or we, you know, whatever. But, um, but I love landscape photography. So an example would be specializing in, you know, in learning how to, you know, masterfully compose landscapes in a way that tells the story that I want to tell. Okay, so it goes beyond just learning general composition or general storytelling or general learning how to see like a photographer and then learning how to shoot in general. Okay, and then learning how to edit in general to create the uh, the big picture changes, the big picture stories that you're trying to you know trying to create. But um, it goes it goes beyond that. Now you're specializing in saying I want to become an expert or I want to become world class at this niche in photography, this niche that is pet photography, this niche, this specialization that is landscape photography, this specialization in wedding photography, okay? Because once you decide like, this is the thing that I want to specialize in, then something powerful happens. Your focus goes towards one specific thing and you start seeing all the time and recognizing opportunities for good landscape photos. And you're constantly thinking, even if you're just driving by in front of your camera, I'm thinking, oh, well, if I shut it like that, I want to make sure the sky isn't overexposed and I want to do this and I want to do this. And then the editing process, I bet I could raise the clarity a little teeny bit to bring out those vibrance details and then I could change the curves and blah, blah, blah. You start thinking about all these things as you're specializing in it. And let me tell you, when you start really focusing and honing in on the thing that's giving you life, the thing that you're excited about, you get freaking good at, okay? Oh yeah. So it's important to, to learn those foundations and then identify the thing that you want to specialize in. It doesn't mean that you're sentenced to only shooting landscape photos or dog photos or wedding photography, right? But you need to specialize so that you become world-class at it. Because like Rich said, listen, I don't want a guy who, uh, is a radiologist, you know, doctor that he's, I think radiologists look at x-rays, right? Like that's what they do. Pretty sure. Yeah, um, sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't I know if I love radiologists. I'm just saying, radiologist? I don't, want that. I don't <laughs> radio, whatever. I, I, I don't want the x-ray, the, the x-ray technician. Okay. As amazing and, and as uh, knowledgeable as they have, I don't want them to do open heart surgery on me. 
Okay. They're, they specialize in bones, I think, you know, uh, I'm not a doctor. I didn't go to med school, so I don't know. Just but think, just spe- think Grey's Anatomy. Just as you think of these analogies, just like I, replay Grey's Anatomy. I am, I have not watched a single episode of Grey's Anatomy. Or, There's or only any, 28 seasons, bro. Come on. Is it 28? I thought it was. I like, don't know. It's a, lot. I don't it's know. a lot. Yeah, it's a I'm lot. Scared. It's like one of the longest shows running. Um, yeah. Anyways, I, I actually have never seen a single episode of Grey's Anatomy, but, um, but yeah, I don't want a a a doctor who specializes in this other thing to you know, do open heart surgery on me. Okay. You don't want a, a photographer who specializes in Gothic senior portraits. Okay. To shoot the advertising campaign for Coca-Cola. It just might mm. not work. Right. Okay. Mm. They're two different things. All right. Yeah. When and, you were, when you were shooting for switch foot and also doing weddings, your brides did not care about concert photos and switch foot really did not care about wedding photos. Am I right? right? Tell me that wasn't something you had to like figure out quick. I remember well, that was a big I, issue of mine. I hadn't shot any weddings at that point. I was a 19. Oh really? Oh, yeah. I, I remember shooting, I remember shooting concerts and like giving out my business card to like and you're production like, oh, companies. And showing bre- weddings. Yeah. Oh, and it's like, like it's like, a, it's like a wedding song in the background and like a flash website. And I'm like, Frick, they're going to think I'm like this fat, boring, bald wedding photographer. Like I talked about last week. So it, it's funny no, how, it's like, once, fat, you, boring, what, bald wedding <laughs> yes. once you specialize in something, you know, you start to look like that something. And, and that's like where you find your identity, like your identity in photography. If you're the, a concert photographer, your website shows that the way you dress shows that the way you present yourself and shake hands and introduce yourself shows that. So this fourth step that seems semi in, insignificant is actually very significant. It matters. So, so important. It's such a special step, you know, it's such a specialized step. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. But no, specializing is okay. so important. Okay. So, so then, then we bring us to the, to the fifth point and you cannot move to the fifth point. You cannot successfully move to the fifth point, fifth part of this without specializing. And here's why, because, you know, the, the fifth part of this framework is to build your business. Okay. Now, a lot of you guys might not want to build a business. That's fine. You don't have to progress to step five. You can stop at step four. That's fine. Like no one's saying you have to do photography as a business. Okay. But it's fun to get paid for something that you love doing. Okay. If you hate your day job, if you hate your day job, all right. And you want to do something that's artistically gratifying. Okay something that you love and you love photography. It's really fun <clears throat> to be able to uh, make a living following your dreams. I, I can speak with absolute, you know, and absolute clarity saying like, it's been a blast to be a photographer, an absolute blast. Now that's my personality. If you love numbers and you love accounting, then maybe you should stay with accounting and just do photography as a fun thing on the side. That's totally fine. I don't know what's right for you, but if you do want to make some money on the weekends, if you do want to build a business, if you do want to quit your job one day, okay, or you know, or if you just want to see if you have what it takes, you need to specialize in a specific type of photography first <clears throat> and then build a business around that specialization, okay? And so the fifth step is to build you know, build a business and we could go really deep down the rabbit hole on business because that's a, that's a very long, very in-depth stuff. And we're in the process of, uh, of making, um, an entire, uh, cause it, this is a very loaded thing. Okay. But, but I'll give you some hints. Okay. Um, cause, cause I don't want to go down too long of a, of a rabbit hole here. Cause we could probably talk for like 18 hours on the business stuff and then barely touch the surface. However, if you want to make money, as a photographer, you need to recognize that there are certain markets of photography, certain niches, certain specializations that are going to be an easier threshold to cross to turning pro in or to to making a living in or to making a good side hustle income in. Okay. Because if you specialize too much in a niche, now I'm not advocating for not specialization. I'm saying if you specialize too much in a niche, where people are not willing to spend money in, it's gonna be really hard to build a business photographing goth iguanas, okay? There's not a big niche photographing goth iguana pet photos, okay? I, I was think- so excited. I was so excited <laughs> to see like what you were gonna pick. I was like, because yeah. I was like thinking of like 
what I would have said. So it was fun to watch you think through that. I, so I appreciate you. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for yeah. I, I, well, there, there's a there's a there's a story. Happen one way or another. Well, no, and 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 your speciality can change too. Like if you would have asked me in college if I wanted to shoot weddings, I was in college and I had a professor. Um, I shot a picture of the Blue Ridge Parkway. I went to college right next to the Blue Ridge Parkway, and I shot this yep. amazing photo. I still love it. It's still printed. And he was like, Rich, that's a great photo. Do you know what will make that worth money? And I'm like all pumped and excited. I'm like, what? He said, a bride in a white dress. And I was like, man, come on. Like, this is a good photo. He said, it is a good photo. But I'm going to let you know that unless you're taking pictures of people, it's it's harder to make money. So people people will pay for pictures themselves. People will pay for bad. Oh, I hit my mic. People will pay for bad pictures of themselves. Don't hit more than they will. He's nice. Yeah, hey, more than they'll hey, pay Joe. for like a really pretty picture of a waterfall. You know what I mean? Like as much as that fills your soul, like find a way to combine what you love to what pays. And that was just like a little teeny sorry business tangent. I can't help it. I've, I've helped no, a I lot of photographers. Yeah. I've helped a lot of photographers that come up to me and say, I love photography, but I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. Don't quit your job as an EMS. Let me teach you photography. And on the weekends, I can teach you how to make 30 grand a year. Like, and yeah. you still get 70 from your job. And that way, you're pulling in 100 grand and you're stoked. Your wife lets you buy whatever camera gear you want. And it's just like, it's like super exciting to watch these people realize they have what it takes. Like, I realize they have what it takes before they do. And that's the fun part about having photography as a career. It's super obtainable, it's super teachable and learnable. Hmm. And as soon as you find your niche and how to sell, you start making money doing what you love and it gets you out of that nine to five hustle. Absolutely. Um, love that. that. That's so good. Yeah. Building, building a business is it, it's, it's crucial to understand some business things because photography is an art form, all right? Learning to see and think through the art that you're trying to create. It's an art form. Okay. Now there's some science and some technical and some geeky stuff to learning how to do the camera. Okay. There's art to it, of course. Okay. But learning the fractions and the dials and the decimal points and stuff like that, um, you know, sometimes that can feel a little bit like, oh, and that's why we have the photo mentorship. We have courses like master your camera that are inside the photo mentorship to teach you step by step how to, you know, get through that stuff that is frustrating, oh, right? It's, there, the there's, there's, there's videos where I show you how every, but I, I literally, B and H will send me a camera. I do a review, tell you if I like it, what I don't like about it. And then I make a separate video showing people exactly where every single button is on their camera and what it does. And that's something that I just took for granted when I first started out. I just kind of slowly figured out like, oh, that's how a depth of preview field button works. You know, it took me like eight years to figure that out. So it's been fun to like walk around a camera and show people exactly what it does. Because once you understand the tool that you have in your hand, it's a lot easier to use. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you have the, you know, the art, the art of like seeing ahead of time, you have the, you know, the science and the technical skill side of controlling your camera and some math, unfortunately, you know, and, um, and you don't have to do a lot of math, but you just need to understand it in general. That's why I, I try to teach it in, in a, a little bit easier way, or a lot easier way to understand in the master camera course, which all of my photo mentorship students have access to. But, um, and then you get back to the art side, uh, which also has some technical uh, for editing to recreate that emotion. Okay. Um, but, uh, but it, it is, it is an art form and art is different than business. It really is. Business can be an art form in itself, but just because you're good at a skill or a craft does not mean that you can run a successful business. Amen. Okay? And so remember the goth iguana. I'm, I'm iguana going to go back there now. Okay. The goth, I, I did that pun earlier and you didn't, you didn't get it. So I was like, oh, I can't uh, do that yeah, no, okay. I know you tried. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, it, it was a long tail joke. So it was just, you know, it's whatever, no, no tailing if it would land anyways. So, um, I lost my train of thought, but business and art are two different things. You were, okay? you were saying there's a lot of, you were saying there's a lot of, I know personally a lot of great Great photographers that make no money that are horrible business. Yeah, make, man. Yeah. Like the, whoever, a, a friend of David's wrote don't, a book don't called. Name, don't Real, name, don't name anyone. <laughs> no, no. Real artists don't starve. 
Um, and that was such a good, you gave me that book and I, I have it somewhere Jeff around Goins. here. It's, Jeff Goins, dear friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, he, it's such a good book. And that's the truth. There's so many great photographers that just kind of like, like, I'm like, why the freak am I making more money than that guy? He's amazing. And it's like, oh, I'm a better businessman. That's hilarious. Cause I'm dumb. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> if I can do it, any, you it's a very dumb, teachable sir. skill. Right. Yeah. Well, define well, but, dumb. But, but, but here's the thing. Um, uh, Business and art, business and art or skill, whatever. I put it this way: business is business, okay. And a lot of people don't want to do business, okay. Being a cabinet maker like my dad, um, and running a business, there's a skill of cabinet making, and then there's the business, which is business. It's two different things, okay. Being an artist like a painter, and then running a business that you sell prints is two different things, Ex extremely different, okay. Being a photographer who knows the skill and the art of photographing and is really freaking good at it is different than building a business, okay? And a lot of artists do not want to run businesses. And a lot of artists should not run businesses, okay? Because no offense, but they're not going to be good at it, all right? Um, unless they decide to learn and embrace some business precepts, some business, um, like, principles that we can teach you okay but here's the thing if you go and you try to specialize too much in photographing goth iguanas probably there's not a good market for people because people are the ones that pay stuff iguanas don't have any money the mountains in the background they don't have any money okay people have money so you have to identify a market where people are willing to spend money in to buy photographs so an example, wedding photography, that is an ever expanding, growing market where you have people, the bride, the groom, the mother, the bride, the family members who are willing, happy to pay money, good money to, to pay you to photograph their wedding and preserve their incredibly important memories, okay? You know, a record label is happy to pay money, okay? For me to photograph a band for their album cover or for the promotional posters, okay? Um, family portraits, we lived on the beach down here. Families are happy to pay money to have a photographer you know, execute and take amazing family portraits of them so that they can hang their canvases on the wall. People pay for pictures, not mountains, not iguanas, you know, uh, you know all these types of things. So it's important to try to identify um, there's a guy named Russell Brunson. He talks about a hot market, okay? Find a mm. market that people are actually spending money in and then build your business that way, okay? Now, I want to talk about this a lot more in a future episode of a podcast, but if you try to build a business off of photographing exclusively goth iguanas with black jackets, you're not going to make any money, okay? I know that's ridiculous, but a lot of photographers try to niche down to something that may not seem ridiculous to them, but to the rest of the world, they're like, I'm not paying for goth iguanas, for pictures of goth iguanas in black jackets. Like, that's not something I'm willing or interested to pay for. And even I would love to see that. <laughs> I know. Uh, should, any, anybody put it in the comments? I would love to see that, by the way. Yeah. Goth iguana. <laughs> yeah, goth iguana <laughs> pictures. <laughs> we got to do that. Um, we got to do that. We got, we got to do that, David. Got, well, I, got see, I, I have one more thing because I'm reading some of these comments as they come in. And this is like yep. my story last week where my where my mother-in-law was like, what are you going to do for money? When you, when you call yourself a photographer, you educate yourself as a photographer. You learn to see, shoot, and edit. And then you start to specialize. And when it comes to the business side, some people will never take art seriously you know your boss that you're about to quit from because you're making money shooting weddings or family portraits will think you're crazy but art is still valuable and your dream and goal to shoot and make money taking pictures is a real thing that you can do and david calls me not stupid i'm saying if i can do it i promise you you can do it if you learn to see shoot and edit like a professional photographer. If you learn to do those things, you can get paid to take photos. I promise Absolutely. you think I can't do it. I'm scared when you're straddling a fence is when it hurts. You got to have that aha moment like David did at the back door of the concert and say, I'm a photographer. And then once you get there, you can say, okay, open your checkbook because that record label, mercy me paid you 
what you charge them. A bride pays me an extra zero on my dollar on my hourly rate because it's a wedding. There's money to be had if you see, shoot, and edit like a photographer. And then specialize in what And then specialize. You, well, and then, yeah. Yeah, and then specialize. I missed it. In, well, well, no, it's fine. Like, you're right. The foundational things are see, shoot, and edit. But, like, for instance, you know, Mercy Me or Colton Dixon or Skillet or Switch, none of these people would have hired me, right, um, if I hadn't have specialized in shooting album covers and bands. If I, if I only, this is the point that you were making earlier, and we're going we're gonna to really break this down in a future episode of the podcast. Um, but if I had shown the bands or the record labels my website where I was only shooting wedding photos, they would not have hired me to photograph uh, you know, that album of Skillet that sold 2 million records. I would have never had that opportunity had I not been specializing in shooting bands prior to that, you know? And, and if you have got the guanas on your website, no bride is going to hire you to shoot their wedding. Okay. You need yeah, to but on, own- a, on a side note in Norway, me and David are going to make a Gothic iguana calendar. That'll be for sale. <laughs> um, is that cool? I mean, is that okay? I mean, we have to take an iguana. I don't know if they're, if are iguanas indigenous to Norway. We'll have to uh, find that out. They're, they're not guana like it, man. Cause it's cold there and they like warm. Water. Hey. You know I mean? Yeah. Um, no, they're not, they're not there, but maybe we can photograph, maybe we can get the background plates, you know, we can composite. Well, I mean, so like Nor- Norway is a great example to kind of wrap up on too. So Norway, if I was going to Norway to get paid to, you know, we're, we're filming a course on how to shoot landscapes and that's great for our students. But like if me and you were trying to make a, a dollar, I would be like, okay, we need to hire somebody in a kayak and and market to an adventure group you know like mm. I, I can't i could take pictures of norway and it's going to be beautiful but everybody does that i need to figure out a way to make that beautiful background sell so i need to put a bride a in a dress yeah, yeah i need to put a human in it so that i can sell it to a magazine um and that's mm-hmm. why you know any outdoor adventure magazine has people camping on it it's not just a picture of the mountains there's people there surfer magazine has a surfer on the wave it's not just a pretty right. wave People, Sometimes it is, people, but yeah, no, you're right. Don't, no, ar- no, don't no. argue with me ever. <laughs> I will not. I will not. Um, that, that's a great point, but he, and here's the thing. Here, here's an example. For those of you guys who are like, I don't want to shoot weddings and all these things. Like, I get that. That's fine. I'm not saying you have to shoot weddings, okay? Um, if you want to be a professional photographer, you need to identify a market that people are willing to spend money in, okay? Food photography is a market that people are willing to spend money in, okay? If you get in the right thing, there's magazines, there's you know book covers that you can shoot, there's... Um, lots of restaurants that you can shoot food photography for, and they always need photos for their, you know, for their Instagrams. There's all sorts of ways that you don't have to shoot humans if you don't want to. Okay. Some of you guys, I don't want to do that. Like, that's fine. If you love nature and you're like, man, I just really want to make money from shooting nature. Like I get that. Maybe, you know, there's a guy, I'm I'm blanking on his name, but there's a guy who wrote a book called business brilliant. I need to look it up. Um, anyways, um, and I read that one. I I read a really good book. Anyways, um, and he, um, he, he wrote this thing and he said, do what you love. I may have even mentioned this on the podcast before. He said, do what you love, but always, always, what's his name? Lewis Schiff. Yeah, Lewis Schiff. Uh, he gave me a mind shift a couple times. Uh, anyways, uh, mind, mind, yeah, mindset shift. Anyways, um, he said, do what you love, but always, always, always follow the money. So if you love shooting landscape photos, Okay, but you want to make money, maybe as an example, you could make a specialization of shooting senior portraits or corporate headshots or wedding photography or elopements in stunning landscape scenery. I have a friend named Mm -hmm. Michaela who shoots elopements in Norway with the mountains in the background. So really all it is, is just stunning scenery, but with a bride and the groom, like small in the picture of this majestic scene, because that's what she specialized in. Like how she's, cool u- is yeah, that? she's using the wedding to fund her travel. Exactly. Okay. You know, and if I was, if I wanted to, um, you know, go on this landscape photography trip, like we're going to do, um, and I wanted to use it as a way to build my wedding photography thing, then like Rich was saying, I could hire a model or meet up with someone or try to figure out a shoot that maybe I could even get paid for while I'm in Norway, okay? And photograph a bride with majestic mountains in the background. And guess what? When you have you know a photo of something that you love that's stunning, 
you're going to sell more of that thing. Okay. So if I have a photo of a bride with the majestic mountains of Norway in the background, guess what? People who want to hire a destination wedding photographer might see my image of a stunning bride with a stunning scene in the background and want to hire me to do that same thing that I love doing. Now, it may look slightly different because I am doing what I love, but I'm following the money. I'm doing a landscape, but I'm following the money of actually photographing a human in that landscape. Now, I'm not saying you can never make money from just landscapes. I'm just saying it's a harder market to break into. Okay. So, that's all I'm going to say about that because we can go so deep into all the business stuff. But I think what we should do is I think we we'll get into uh, it in five podcasts from now. Five podcasts yeah, from now. We'll five podcasts. I think we need to do a specialized talk on each of these things, and maybe we can combine a couple of them. But we need to wrap. Yeah. We need to give away this camera bag. That way, we unload some of the baggage. Yeah. Oh, there's my my office is like slowly getting full of stuff from B and H Photo, which is awesome. Yeah, B and H is amazing. Okay. Best camera store in the world. All right, I have Dude. a winner. Sweet. So we ran, we randomly pick these winners. So no one complaining. No one. Hey, do not email my team and be like upset that you didn't win this camera bag. Okay. Some some people have been not nice lately. You guys, we're trying to be nice. We're trying to help people out. We're trying we to random, give you something for free, bro. Yeah, yeah. Be nice about it. Okay. Yeah. Don't be mean. There's humans on the other side of that computer screen. Okay. All right. We're yeah. trying to give you our expertise and our time. And B and H is giving us camera bags to give you. So and if you about, didn't okay? win, just come back next week because we're give something yeah. away there. If yeah, you really we'll want to win something, join the photo mentorship because we give something away every time we go live. We're literally giving stuff away like three or four times a week. So yeah, yeah. come get if it. You, if you guys want to learn how to master your craft, if you want to learn how to see like a photographer, shoot like a professional photographer, control your camera, man your mode, and edit like a pro – please join us at the photo mentorship because that's our amazing community where we have over a thousand students who are learning and growing together. And it's absolutely phenomenal. You get unlimited access to stream all of my photography courses, Rich's photography courses and our other photography mentors courses and tutorials that we make that, you know, our list is ever expanding, ever growing. You know, like when we go to Norway, we'll be making a landscape photography course or two that will be exclusively avail available for the land, uh, the photo mentorship students inside there. So you get unlimited access to stream all of our courses and you get to ask unlimited questions and get answers from professional photography experts. So go over to the photomentorship.com and join us there um, in our amazing membership community and learn how to become, you know, an amazing photographer. Let's give away this camera bag. The winner. All right, ready is, for the drum roll? Let me see that drum roll. You you hear a drum the roll? The winner. See it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, quit yelling at me. And the winner is Lorelai Ma. Lorelai Ma. Okay, that's awesome. M A M A H. We'll tag you in it. All I need is your address, and then I'll come stock you. Maybe I'll put a prize in the bag. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put um I don't know like a love note on a post it. Right. In there. So Lorelai. Yeah. You Lorelei. won. What an awesome! That's a, that's an awesome name, by the way. Not very common. I love it. Yeah. Hey, M Monica. Monica Henderson just said the photo mentorship is one of the best investments I've made towards getting better at my photography. Thanks for sharing that, Monica. You're awesome. I Monica. Yeah. Your favorite. My favorite. You're, Monica. You're so awesome. sorry. You're awesome. Sorry, everybody else. Yeah. All right. So Lorelai Ma. Ma. Is that what you said? Lorelai one, and we'll be yeah. we'll we'll be in contact with you. Um, to make sure and get your address and ship you this camera bag and, uh, and all that stuff. Hey, thank you guys so much. She for, says she's for, excited. She saw it. She saw it. She's on. She said she saw it. She said she's so excited. Thanks for sharing. You rock, Lorelai. Tell all your friends. Oh, we just want to help people, man. There you go. Hey, Lorelai. I, I don't know if we're pronouncing your name right, but that's awesome. You have a pretty profile picture too. I did. I did. I did Google it. I Googled pronunciation before I, I dived in there. I was nervous. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Christina Mead said, the, said a love letter from Little Dick. <laughs> You're gonna yes. get a love letter from Little Dick. <laughs> yes. I'll put a little oh. dick in there for you. Oh gosh. Love it. Uh fantastic. Well thank you all so much for um for tuning into this podcast episode. Next week we're gonna dive deep. This is okay with you guys. We're gonna dive deep into how to see like a professional photographer. Boom. You guys have a fantastic day. Rich. I love you. I was learning. I was trying to see. I was trying to see into the future. Uh, you have, you have of the that. caps on, on the on the binoculars. Bro, so I, work when you have the caps gosh, on, you know? man. we're gonna cap on this conversation and say we'll see you later. <laughs> I love you. All right. I love you. Please subscribe on iTunes or Spotify so you never miss out on news and events.
Give us a rating on iTunes or simply tell a friend about us. It helps us get the word out so we can help more people reach their photography goals. This podcast is brought to you by thephotomentorship.com.